Okay, so the title is obviously clickbait. I've called this the most important rule of writing, um, and it's not. Um, but there you go. I'm going to stop doing so many of these videos, but I thought I'd get this one off my chest and then um, get stuck into the writing again, which is what I really should be doing. Um, and to uh, bring this to a fairly rapid conclusion, I've uh, started recording it very close to um, my daughter's bedtime. So I will need to wrap things up. I didn't think of myself as being a particularly wordy person, but it turns out that I specialize in these sort of low energy, um, wordy rambles. So let's be focused. Um, I'm going to talk about description and I'm not going to talk about um, the sort of lowest level of, of description, the sort of how many adjectives should you have and the uh, what's a simile and what's a metaphor. I'm going to talk about the, the high level instantiation, the way it appears through a book. Um, and obviously there are no writing rules, even grammar is fairly optional. Um, this is a sort of very loose form of the, the pirate code, if you like. The the re one of the reasons I, I never give or never normally move to give writing advice is just quite how different um, different writers approach the whole business. Um, I was at a, a thing with uh, Gerard Bacrombie and some other authors, and uh, we were each asked to describe our sort of method. And I said, well, you know, I start typing, and I type some more, keep on going, and then stop. And that's basically how I write a book. And the thing that I've typed out is pretty much 90% the same as the thing that appears between the covers uh, on the shelves. Sometimes it's more than 95%, on rare occasions it's it's less and there's some more messing about to do. Um, and, and Joe Abercrombie came and he described a very different method. And the important thing here is not the details that I'm going to try and remember, but the fact that it was very, very different. He said he, he like writes a page where he plots out the outline of a book and then he expands that and he turns it into a whole bunch of titles of chapters or, and, you know, a paragraph for each chapter. And then he pulls that and he gets like five pages per chapter. And now he's sort of pulling those lines apart and in between each of those those five page per chapter lines, the two lines that he's pulled apart, he's now filling in sort of five or six lines to replace them. And those five or six lines have flesh on the bones and a sort of proper written prose. Um, and he's basically increasing and increasing the resolution of this novel and when he gets to the last stage he's basically prettying his language rather than um th there can be any surprises or anything new will occur because it's a very sort of defined process whereas i'm just sort of wandering through the story and hoping things will turn out well in much the same way that i'm making this video um and in that context it's very hard to offer up a piece of advice um, and think it will be useful to anyone and even worse to say this is this is how you do it and if you don't do it this way you're wrong which i have seen people um do on on many occasions don't believe them so i'm going to talk about description and the first thing to talk about it is the chunk um just as when somebody first picks up a, a pen and starts trying to write they often confuse description with being the art of adding a bunch of adjectives in front of every noun when people get a bit better at writing, they often uh, confuse description with being um, writing these great chunks of, of description and then just tacking a whole bunch of those chunks together to, to make a book. And one of the reasons people fall into that trap is that um, there's nothing wrong with a chunk of description. And there are some excellent chunks of description out there and I think every book should have them. And the reason we focus on them is that they're easy to remember, they're easy to find and point at. So you can go and you can say, um, what's great description? Or oh, I'll think of, I don't know, Gandalf or against the Balrog. And I'll go and look that up and I'll look for the, the, the paragraphs of description associated with it. And I'll say, there you go, some great description. And I've got two chunks I'm going to show you um, from my reading experience. And they're fine. Uh, these, these are good, powerful chunks. But actually, the majority of the description in any book is not description delivered in chunks um, and the the sort of donkey work of description is done in a completely different way and uh, people just focus on these chunks because they're, they're easy to see and it creates this illusion that that's all there is. So here's a, a one from Alan Garner, a very well regarded uh, British writer, uh, written in 1963 this one um, and it's the 
I'm just giving you the end of a very sizable piece. Uh, let's just read it. We ride, we ride, round heads of black hair they had, the same length neck and brow, and their eyes gleamed darkness. They wore long hooded black cowls, and they carried black wide grooved swords well balanced for the stroke. The horses were black, even to the tongues. Wood and valley and stream swept by, field and hedge and lane, by Capsthorn, by and Wisterfield, three miles and more, Windy Harbour, Withington, Welltroth, and there stood Broad Hill, the Tunstead of old, and its pines fled red under the spear. Wakeful are the sons of Ormar, wakeful Madoc and Midir, Mathramil, ride Einhirar of the Harflin. We ride, we ride, their cloaks were as blue as rain-washed sky, their yellow manes spread wide upon their shoulders, five barbed javelins in their hands, and their silver shields with fifty knobs of burnt gold on each, and the bosses of precious stones. They shone in the night as if they were the sun's rays. The horses' hooves were polished brass, and their hides like cloth of gold. Now the iron here are, were complete. <clears throat> That's um, written in a sort of mythic style. Um, it's it's uh, describing a sort of long-awaited arrival of the wild hunt, um, which is sort of the the high piece of the of the magic that's as old as the hills, and it's in a sort of style like a grand epic poem and a Beowulf, or it's the sort of uh, spirit that Tolkien was channeling when he he wrote the Silmarillion, the sort of and lo he smote his ruin seven times upon the mountainside sort of thing. That's I just made that up. It's not what Tolkien said, but it, it's in that style and it's memorable. I remember it after many decades uh, since I wrote read it as a as a teen. Um, and it's a temptation if someone says, oh, show me some good description, I might cite that because it's a chunk. Um, this piece is by George Martin, 35 years later. Um, it's describing um, a castle and it's saying that um, it, it comes after a, uh, a piece of... Um, history and, and myth associated with this castle as well so it's it's part of a, again a larger piece but it changes character here and it becomes more specific gods do not forget and still the gales came raging up the narrow sea yet storm's end endured through centuries and tens of centuries a castle like no other its great curtained wall was a hundred feet, feet high unbroken by arrow slit or postern everywhere rounded, curving, smooth, its stones fit so cunningly together that nowhere was crevice nor angle nor gap by which the wind might enter. That wall was said to be 40 feet thick at its narrowest and near 80 on the seaward face, a, course of a double course of stones with an inner core of sand and rubble. Within that mighty bulwark, the kitchens and stables and yards sheltered safe from wind and wave. Of towers there was but one, a colossal drum tower, windowless where it faced the sea, so large that it was granary and barracks and a feast hall and lord's dwelling all in one, crowned by massive battlements that made it look from afar like a spiked fist atop an upthrust arm. So again, um, fine piece of uh, description and a big chunk, um, and that's not all of it. Um, and it even ends with a vague point of view in there, like the first, everything we read up to that last line is a sort of uh, omniscient, just information. Um, and then at the very thing, it's someone is looking at it and we're hearing what it looks like to them. And that someone is one of the, the main characters in the story. Um, this is all good. I mean, George Martin is, a um, fantastic world build he's got this huge world he needs to build he's got lots of heavy lifting to do so he has to put in some big tranches where he just tells you a bunch of stuff um that's in part info dumping which we may talk about at another time but it's also description is, is woven in there and where one fades into the other it can be uh, difficult to identify um but i'm not but what i'm saying here is that by all means, by no means, the, the be all and end all of description. Um, so I'm going to move on to looking at two chunks of writing by some really good writers. But now it's not the description in them isn't in one piece. It's laced throughout the whole text, uh, returning time and again to um, each subject 
and building on it. So you're getting this sort of you're getting it painlessly delivered to you. You're hardly aware of it, and yet you're assembling in your mind um, the picture that is required. And in these descriptions, um, as in all good description, really, the um, the description is delivered to us through the lens of a point of view character. All description comes with its own baggage. So the, even the two chunks we read there, the author had made the the choice of which things to focus on and tell us about. Um, and that informed us something about the author's interest in this story-wise. But when you in the story with characters doing the descriptions in the point of view of a character, then you are simultaneously illuminating the character and the thing, the, the choices they make in um, what they notice about the uh, thing, what they feel is important to tell you um, can be very sort of um, illuminating, can be very informative. So, for example, you know, if, if you have a character and they see a man and so one character might notice the physicality of them, the broadness of the chest, you know, the, the tightness of the buttocks, they might be uh, uh, attracted to them. And another might be thinking um, whether they're armed or not, how dangerous they are, what sort of mood that person's in. Um, and a third might be thinking, uh, you know, who that person reminds them of. And, and so each of the different point of views will select a different set of things to uh, to notice about this person and enlarge upon them in the context of their own experience and their current needs and interests. Um, so let's move on. So in these pieces, I, I've got one by Josiah Bancroft and then one by Alex Harrow. Um, I am going to just focus on the description of one thing and it's going to be in both cases the, the physical setting essentially the building they're in um, and highlight when we describe when the description focuses on it but don't be misled that that's all the description that's going on it's not there are interlaced descriptions of lots of different stuff building on itself continuously the whole thing is a great woven mass of interlaced descriptions um, which is all then wrapped around the story and excitement and is painlessly bathing you in the um, the setting and the characters and everything that's going on and hardly a chunk of description in sight. And this is uh, efficient and good writing too. So uh, there's a picture of a Rolls Royce there uh, and I'm just saying that um, the chunk descriptions are the sort of showy elements of the car, like the, the chrome grill and the spirit of ecstasy on the top of that. Whereas the sort of description I'm talking about here is the engine that drives your story along. Uh, and if you don't have that in it, then you've just got this fairly pretty but static object that, that nobody is going to want to read um, for more than a few pages. So here, um, because it's... Um, it's easy to identify chunks of description I've already said, um, but this sort of description, um, you know, you don't tend to note as you're reading it. And so um, it's, it's hard to find like great famous examples of it. Uh, and here, all I've done is I've said, who's a good writer? Okay, Josiah Bancroft. Um, can I remember any uh, particular scene change in there? Oh yeah, I remember they go to this party. Um, and then I went and looked at the chapter and said, I'm going to just focus on the setting, the building it's in, uh, and I'm going to look at where and when he describes that through the chapter. Um, so we've got the entire chapter here. I'm not going to read it. Um, I'm just going to scroll through it. And what I've done is highlight in various colours the areas of description about the, the setting. So we do open up with quite a, a piece of um, of description. And, you know, that's natural. He just walked into this place. He's going, you're going to have to, you're going to notice a bunch of stuff at once but you'll find that it's not just this chunk at the top and then job done. Now let's just move on to what happens in this setting. We are continually expanding and revisiting and elaborating on, on the setting as we go through. Um, I've highlighted in yellow uh, descriptions that are um, essentially just descriptions. They don't, they don't directly or obviously involve the point of view doing the description. And in orange, I've uh, highlighted when the character, Stenlin in this case, um, is directly and obviously involved in it. 
So um, we open up with this line saying they joined the line of guests flowing for the doors, which were as tall as oak trunks. And and that as tall as oak trunks, you know, okay, maybe it tells us that Senlin has um, seen oak trees in his life, uh, but it's not dialect directly relatable to anything that we already know about him uh, though if he were to continue to describe everything in terms of trees we, we might learn more about him it's a particular interest of his or that that's where he came you know he, he lived in a forest i don't know uh, but the next line with butlers in white bibs and black tails senlin found their livery all too familiar so something in his past in this story has um given him this this fear or interest in in this this um particular uniform and has caused him to notice among all of the things in this great party in this this, this hall the butlers um so that's specific to him and it's telling us you know he's worried about about this it's making him nervous um i've only got one of these highlights in blue and i guess that's what have i said about uh highlighting in blue um, i think it's uh again that it's a uh, yeah th this is a sort of um using a simile but again the simile doesn't really um come from anything we know about senlin um you know it tells us he's been in a gorge and <laughs> and knows what that's like i guess um so i just move on through, through this i'm not going to read it but you can see that lots of this description involves um senlin and his experiences you can just see um this piece here about as museums it went it outshone the most fabulous he'd ever seen so it's talking about his experience um it's not just uh isolated hanging there in the air so we've, we've gone for all of that but now we go for a few more paragraphs and we've got a whole bunch more stuff about the setting that's becoming apparent as he's moving through it as it's different things within it are becoming important to him um and so we can see uh it starts talking about uh, the crowds and whatnot and then it uh talks about the art on the on the walls and that's something sending those about so color that in a different color to show that um he's using his own experience there it's reflecting upon him um and as we move through, we can see that we are um, continuing to just reference the, the scene. So now we, we've lost the focus on the building and, and the place, and we're starting to talk about the plot and, and getting on with the things they need to be getting on with. But we're constantly reminded where they are. Uh, Taru moved through the party as if it was his own, um, just so that we don't lose track of the idea that they are in the middle of this crowd. Um, and we continue just having it laced all the way through things that reference objects and places and subdivisions of this great hall um, to, to uh, remind us that, that we are there and where we are and, and to make use of it. And even this, this far down, we are um, being reminded of the, the, the how this place is populated and um, what the uh and some of the things we may have seen earlier are now becoming um involved and dangers um and just here you know the room seemed to be listening as if and leaning in it's just reminding you that there's a great crowd there um so it's, it's describing that setting um and we haven't done our job at the top we're doing it the entire way through and you can um go to the blog and, and look for this yourself if you, if you want to pick apart what he's been doing here uh, and even towards the, the very end where we finish um we get this just once more a reminder about the guests and the mansion and where they are we've been talking about completely different stuff this whole time we've been getting on with the plot and all sorts of other things are being described and those descriptions are laced throughout all these but we just keep on touching touching using as a touchstone the the setting and reminding ourselves where we are grounding ourselves in that um and the other piece i looked at was um from alex harrow's uh 10, doors of january which is a very good book she's a very 
um, good writer. And I had uh, Selin Ascend there as well. Um, and this is a, a shorter piece. Um, again, it's I've highlighted the stuff that is about the, the setting. I'll just read the first few lines. Um, so let's expand it a little piece. As was his custom, Mr. Locke had taken rooms for us in the nicest establishment available. In Kentucky, that translated to a sprawling Pinewood Hotel on the edge of the Mississippi, clearly built by someone who wanted to open a grand hotel but hadn't ever met one in real life. There were candy-striped wallpaper and electric chandeliers, but a sour catfish smell seeped up from the floorboards. Mr. Locke waved past the manager with a fly-swatting gesture, told him to keep an eye on the girl, that's a good fellow, and swept into the lobby with Mr. Sterling trailing like a man-shaped dog at his heels. Locke greeted a bow-tied man waiting on one of the flowery couches. So there's a lot of different things going on there. And we're, you know, even at, towards the end of that section, waiting on one of the flowery couches, we're still getting pieces of information about the setting. We don't just like start talking about this hotel, get the flowery couches in and then move on. It's laced around action and the couch becomes important when our man focuses on somebody who happens to be sitting on them. Um, you're getting a strong voice there of uh, the character, the character's sense of humour, um, the idea of uh, having haven't ever met a, a hotel, haven't ever seen a proper hotel in real life, so he's done his best to um, uh, create one out from scratch. Um, and the, the man-shaped dog, um, all of that is illuminating the person who's doing the description because it's giving a sense of their character and entertaining us with um, their cleverness. And and we've got very you know, much lower level. She is, um, her is um, using different senses here. So she's got the smell added on to the, the pure visuals uh, in Bancroft's piece. He was primarily adding um, audio, like he was telling us about the things that Bank that um, Thenling could hear as well as all of the stuff he saw. Um, and so you see, you've got that initial burst of, of description, but um, then there are lines further on into the text that reference the setting again, the idea uh, reminding us the managers there and talking about the kitchens and the maids. Um, and then she's knocking over a tall vase of flowers. And again, if we just sort of at the front started talking about this hotel and saying and in the lobby it was punctuated with tall vases of flowers, that would have been a very static um, and big, bigger chunk of, of description. But now we are just reinforcing them, adding in detail here and there as it becomes important. She's interactive with this thing. And so it enters our sphere of, um, of awareness. Um, and, you know, back here, we're still referencing this hotel and talking about it. We're um, just reiterating the, the, the smell of the place. And then four pages go by where we do completely different things, but we are still coming back to this hotel, talking about it, uh, reinforcing the ideas that we've um, been introduced to and, building on them. So um, here uh, she's been put back into the care of this hotel manager and she's um, winding him up by uh, messing about on the grand piano. But the fact that there's a grand piano there is again just putting another piece of furniture into the picture of that hotel. Oh, it's the sort of hotel that has a grand piano in the foyer, is it? And and then there's this little girl smashing on the, on the keys and the, uh, the nervous manager hoping she's not going to break it. Um, and then you, she's out of the window and we're talking about um, final sort of line uh, when I stumbled back into the sagging and not very grand hotel so again this this sagging um, is giving us just another layer of um, description of the place maybe it, it's uh, getting a bit tired it needs it needs updating um, and all of these lines are well separated and, and layered in through, through the text. No one is going to say, oh, there's a great description of a hotel and chalk, here it is, because there isn't. There's a great 
if you read it, you get a great feeling for a hotel because you've been given 26 little injections of hotel stuff throughout what is a, a chapter that's dealing with something completely different and is very entertaining in its own right. And you don't want to be slowed down by a big description of a hotel. You get it like this. That's good description. And that's all I have to say about it, really. I will leave it there. And yes, we're in under 20 minutes, so my plan worked. I'm going to uh, hunt for the button that turns you guys off and say goodbye.